So welcome back for part two of the Permian period. We've already looked at the Pangaea element, meaning the supercontinent that was sutured together really with the mountain building events of the Pennsylvanian and formally became fully assembled during the Permian period. But we're going to take a little bit to talk about the life forms and the significance of how plate tectonics and climate played a role and what kind of animals existed, what kind of plants, and where they were located. So this is El Capitan Reef, and we have talked about the rock unit itself from Carlsbad. Let's look at some of the organisms that you would find in these rock units that make up the areas that would have been limestone or open marine environments during that time. Fusilinids would be one. We learned about them during the Pennsylvanian and the early Permian period where we had the mass production of carbonate rock with the Arbsaroka Sea was favorable to the existence of fusilinids. They were a major reef builder actually where some rocks almost are exclusively made up of thousands of these small little single-celled organisms that got as big as they ever would during those two time periods, the end of the Pennsylvanian and the early Permian, which makes them great index fossils for the late Paleozoic. So we uh, know that they're index fossils for both the late Permian and or the late Pennsylvanian. We know they're index fossils for the late Pennsylvanian and early Permian rocks because of their ab abundance and diversity that existed during this time frame, but not for long. As we have Pangaea symbol, conditions are radically going to change for ocean sediments, and we're going to see a drier climate as a consequence. Here's some fusilinids from the Permian period, and there are a lot of different shapes for these animals. I kind of think most of them look like footballs, but you can actually pick them up, and they're like big fat grains of rice and that have kind of exploded in the middle. They're kind of fat in the middle. But nevertheless, fusilinids are very common. So if I were to walk out into the field and see rocks that contain these, I would immediately think late Paleozoic, specifically either the late Pennsylvanian or early Permian. If I knew I was in the stratigraphic column, I could identify almost which exact species would be present at either of those times. Something else that appeared, not that we didn't have them before now, but they were very common in the coral reefs were spiny brachiopods. Productives are a type of brachiopods that were very, very weird shapes and they made long spiny structures like you'd see right here coming off of their shells. I'm not sure what's up with that, but nevertheless we find them in the late Paleozoic and they pretty much disappear after that. So they take a really hard hit in the Permian mass extinction events. So you've got to think back to the beginnings of brachiopods. They started in the Cambrian. So they've been with us Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Mississippian, Pennsylvanian, all the way through the Permian. And I might add, they survived the Permian mass extinction events. So something's really good for them. However, many of them died, and this would be an aversion that would have. It is important to note that they were successful animals in all marine settings from the Sauk all the way to the Arbsaroka Sea on upwards through the two that we haven't covered yet, which will be the Zuni and the Tejas. More to come on those lost sequences. Like the late Pennsylvanian, bryozoans are very important to the marine life that we see during the early Permian. They are really important for reef building along with sponges. And we see the same kinds that we saw back in the Pennsylvanian, which was lacy fenestrate. We even saw some back in the Mississippian. Remember bryozoans made their debut in the Ordovician, not the Cambrian. And we started seeing unique types by the Mississippian and certainly the Pennsylvanian and again and the Permian. All right, let's get talking about the reptiles. The reptiles do some basic evolutionary radiation during the Permian. As a matter of fact, pelicosaurs are going to be the dominant reptile of their time. So what is a pelicosaur? Most of them had fins on their back. So the obvious things that people want to lean towards, what was the purpose of the fins, was for mating, for sexual display, 
for alarming your predators, for disguise. They had a spot here that would be a nice de deterrent. Not all pelicosaurs were ferocious, mean, and predatory carn carnivores. Matter of fact, many of them were herbivorous type animals. The most important thing to learn about these guys is twofold. Number one, they actually are the lineage, or at least the carnivorous versions of them, that would give rise to the therapsids, which are going to be the mammal-like reptiles, then that will subdivide again in the Mesozoic and set the lineup for dinosaurs. So they'll be an important lineage. All pelicosaurs went extinct during the Permian period. Most were extinct well before the mass extinction event at the end of the Permian. So they had a fairly narrow window of time. We started seeing some in the Pennsylvanian, but they become the dominant reptile by the Permian. The most scary of them all, and probably the most famous, is the Dimetrodon. If you look at this, and this is an actual fossil, this one's at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, and Having been to see this particular uh, fossil at the American Museum of Natural History, I can tell you that it sits about probably with its fins. I'm sure it had extra skin at the top of its fins. It probably stands about three and a half, four feet tall, maybe a little taller. And it got about, mm, this particular one was probably six to eight feet long. But take a look at those chompers. Most people would mistake it for a dinosaur, and I can give you a couple of reasons why it's not. First of all, no dinosaurs had evolved during the Paleozoic. Didn't happen. They wouldn't be even conceptualized till the Triassic. Number two, the reason no dinosaurs existed was the hip socket that is necessary to be in the classification of dinosauria had not evolved yet. So if you can imagine the reptiles during the Paleozoic, starting in the Mississippi and certainly in the Pennsylvania and in the Permian, they would have had to swing their legs outward and not be able to walk with their legs right beneath them like reptiles, uh, some do today. And I can think of a good example, birds. Uh, birds walk like uh, the reptiles that are going to have that uh, hip socket that we're talking about. So if you've ever seen them kind of walk around, their legs are right underneath them. But if you've ever seen a salamander walk or you've ever seen maybe a lizard uh, run, you know what I'm talking about, where they kind of move their legs side to side and wiggle. That's how these animals evolved. And they just didn't have all the goods going for them with the body plan that would be the most successful. Having said that, Dimetrodon is so famous for leading to the likely evolution of what we know existed called therapsids. So that brings me to a very unusual organism that would make it through the mass extinction event. Most therapsids would go extinct, but a handful would survive the Permian mass extinction event to radiate and evolve and split again into different categories, one of which will be the ancestors of real mammals and then the ancestors of uh, dinosaurs. These are mammal-like reptiles. What do I mean by that? We'll look at some of the characteristics in just a second. But keep in mind that they evolved from carnivorous pelicosaurs and they diversified very quickly between the different herbivorous and carnivorous types. They made up 90% of all known reptiles by the end of the Permian period. And like I said, things like Demetrodon had gone extinct long before the mass extinction event of the Permian. So what was so unique about these animals known as therapsids? They're medium to small sized reptiles and the types of mammalian features they had are important. They had fewer bones in the skull. Some of them were fused like our skulls are. They had enlarged lower jaw bones, allowing them for some teeth modifications that would 
be used for nipping, tearing, and chewing food. Sound familiar, doesn't it, to our body plan? Their legs were more vertically placed under their hip girdles, and they may have been able to maintain a constant inner body temperature known as endothermic. Many scientists believe that therapsids were endothermic. That's important to note for a variety of levels of reasons. But if reptiles were not all cold-blooded and some were warm-blooded like mammals are today, that sets a whole new light on how they survived. So pelicosaurs, many of them, the thoughts are that they actually use their fins to help regulate their temperatures and they would use it to absorb heat and then in the wind they would allow it to release heat. So these guys aren't pelicosaurs, they're descendants of them, or at least the carnivorous versions. I know he's not the most attractive guy. This is a model and give him some credit, but this is a probably good, pretty fair estimate about what they look like. They weren't huge animals, but they had some, mammal some mammalian features that are important. Some very famous types of these organisms existed, and as I said, some of them made it into the next geologic period of the Triassic. All right, there is no Permian lecture that's complete without talking about the most famous Gondwana plant ever. Glossopterus. So you can remember back to plate tectonics and physical that we talked about fossil evidence of finding this guy on Africa, South America, India, and Antarctica, meaning that all the southern continents were clustered together at about the same latitude because of the type of climate conditions that Glossopterus would have needed. Glossopterus was not a swamp plant, so it was not one that you would have found with some of our other guys we learned about in the Pennsylvanian. This would have been a forest-dwelling, freestanding type of tree. And Glossopterus would have required these very specific conditions to exist, which is compelling uh, evidence suggesting that the continents were all together during this narrow window of time during the Permian period. So the Paleozoic's been all about how do you bring the continents together. So I bet you can guess that the Mesozoic's going to be all about how do we split them apart. While the animals and organisms are a whole different department of story in each of these periods, the basic theme is split up a supercontinent, bring it back together, and split it up again. And that's exactly what's happened in the case of the Paleozoic. These are Glossopterus leaves, and as I mentioned, they're found on all the five major Gondwana continents. And keep in mind, they're not flowering plants. We don't have those yet, not until the early Cretaceous. But they are nevertheless gymnosperms, able to make seeds and germinate outside the presence of water, which makes them extremely versatile and widespread. Conifers. Something else that's noteworthy that made up forest as the climate began to shift and become more and more dry as the interior sections of Pangaea became rain shadowed and lacked the moisture that was available. Conifers tend to exist in drier climates. So if you've been to ski resorts, meaning such as snow skiing, you know as you get in higher elevation, conifers become more dominant because it's drier up there in higher elevations. So that likely would have been the case for these guys as well. Of course, you can have conifers in Houston, Texas, right? You can have pine trees right there. Nevertheless, the conifers that we had back at this time, they were seed plants that evolved, and these gymnosperms that were conifers appeared, which could bear cones, and the cones were where the reproduction would occur once the cones hit the ground and allow for germination and expansion of the conifers to make forest. Ginkgos is another type of fossil that we find starting in the Permian period. They made their debut there. We actually still have them today. They're considered a living fossil. Interestingly enough, McLennan Community College actually has one of these on our campus that's alive. So if you didn't know that, you can take a plant tour with our botanist 
when we have Sustainability Day, we typically offer a tree tour, and this is one of the featured trees of the tour. So uh, they haven't changed very much, have they? And this is important because these guys are more closely related to conifers than they are to any other gymnast firm, yet they don't live exactly in the same habitats. Cycads are another one of the living fossils in the plant department from the Permian period. So we've got two. This one uh, is an ancient group of cone producing plants that evolved during the Permian period that put these cones in the middle of their plant system. Again, they're not flowering plants like palm trees, although they kind of have the same body plan. They are not flowering plants at all. And so the cones would fall off and germinate and create new plants. We still have cycads today. We are now to the third Hall of Fame mass extinction event known as the Great Dying. And it is truly a funeral moment for some of our most beloved fossils that evolved during the Paleozoic. Let's start with the marine department. Around 96% of all marine life went extinct. Let's look at some of the key animals that were just completely wiped out. 100% of trilobites. No more, they're done. Fully extinct, belly up. 100% of fusilinids. That's why they're such great markers for their time periods, right? For the late Pennsylvanian and early Permian. 100% of rugose corals and tabulate corals go extinct. No more of them. 100% of blastoids. That makes me sad. I like blastoids. I love trilobites. And these animals are done. So whenever you find them in the rock record, they're precious because we don't have any more of them being made anytime in geologic future or currently. We had orders of bryozoans that went extinct, mollusk, brachiopods. Just about anything that lived in the ocean would take a tumble and have significant hits. If they didn't lose everybody, that was great news because things like the ammonoids and brachiopods are going to have a comeback in the Mesozoic. But marine life is almost wiped to nothing. So Triassic is going to be a huge time of recovery. We have to look at the land department. We just created all these amphibians starting in the Devonian and then find our reptiles by the late Mississippian and throughout the Permian and Pennsylvanian periods. We're going to take a serious hit to them. So any kind of vertebrates such as amphibians and reptiles are significantly impacted up to 70% loss. We lose over a third, 33% of insects die off at the end of the Permian. I'll tell you who comes out glowing in terms of low numbers of loss, and that's plants. So what's up with that? Let's investigate some of the hypotheses that are actually plausible and talk about what could have caused such a horrible event. Today, the general consensus is that the cause of the great dying was an episode of deep sea anoxia. Do you remember learning about what that kind of looked like when we were looking at what was happening with the ocean chemistry a few periods back? So we also know that there was increased carbon dioxide, and the carbon dioxide would have resulted in highly stratified oceans and a shifting of a warmer climate. Oxygen-rich surface water did not circulate to the deep ocean, and this would allow for anoxic conditions to occur. And this would lead to a worldwide catastrophic event. So while that explains what happened in the ocean, the ocean may be the base of the food chain, but it's not the only source of food for animals that live on land. Something had to be beyond the marine extension in order to kill off 70% of vertebrates that lived on land and then 33% of insects. So let's take a peek. There was widespread volcanism at the end of the Permian period, specifically in Russia, known as the Siberian Traps. This is a large geographic area that laid down an incredible amount of lava that's basalt in a relatively short period of geologic time in terms of millions of years. When it released 
its materials, not just the lava, it also released substantial amounts of volcanic gases in the form of carbon dioxide and high concentrations of fluorine and chlorine into the atmosphere, which would have become toxic. Some studies suggest that this toxic chemical brew actually ate through some of our uh, ozone layer and increased the UVB radiation levels on the planet. If you're not familiar with UVB specifically, it's one of the main causes of skin cancer. So this particular radiation uh, would be devastating to anything on life, but you still think it would have wiped out the plants. Maybe the plants had some kind of mechanism for fighting this. Nevertheless, the animals did not. And so it took a pretty serious hit and was gloom and doom for any animal that survived. If you could find food, then you would survive, and some did, and would lead to the re-diversification of life in the Triassic. So as we're leaving the mass extinction, before I cover the high points of the Permian, I just kind of want to go back and link the periods together for a minute and show you what all's happened in such a short, brief period of time. The Cambrian starts off with this remarkable Cambrian explosion where we radiate almost all known phylums of animals at minus one or two within just a few million years. Then we enter in the Burgess Shale, the middle of the Cambrian, and we produce some of the weirdest species ever found that were soft-bodied. The Cambrian, we'd lose 75% of trilobites while it wasn't a mass extinction event. It was significantly impacting to marine life at that time. The Ordovician represented the beginning of it, the Sauk Sea that came off. And then we would have the Middle Ordovician through the beginning of the Devonian be the widest spread of Pyrrhic Sea known as the Tippy Canoe. The Ordovician gave us a couple of new life forms such as corals and gave us bryozoans. But it ended with a mass extinction event, totally kind of resetting the clock for marine organisms. Mind you, we had fish by the end of the Cambrian, so now we're going to have from jawless fish, we moved to jawed fish in the Ordovician. So as we move into the Silurian, we have widespread apiric seas that were very much Bahama-like conditions across North America. And we would build large barrier reef systems that would lead to massive evaporites. We would develop some new animals, like the Eurypterid and the sea scorpion that's in the ocean. But we would also have life move on to land. And that's a big deal. So if you recall, at the Ordovician, we had non-vascular plants, but by the Silurian, we have vascular plants. That's a pretty substantially important step in evolution. Not to mention in the Silurian, we also have the millipede move onto land and likely the scorpion. As we move into the Devonian, the Kaskaskia Sea takes over after the Tippecanoe had regressed off. And it makes some remarkable evaporite deposits, just like we saw in the Silurian, but in a different locations. It would also produce some stagnated water conditions that we would learn about that created the Chattanooga Shale. And that's important to note because that Chattanooga Shale is also found a similar layer throughout Canada. And we see kind of the same thing happen at the beginning of the Mississippian, all in response to a change in what was going on with our supercontinents. So as we move into the Mississippian, the Mississippian was different for us in the United States because we had widespread Bahama-like carbonate deposition all the way from coast to coast pretty much, except where the highlands were. And we created thick sequences of this material and would see radiation in the marine department as a consequence with lots of crinoids, bryozoans, blastoids. As sea level changed again at the end of the Mississippian, we would start the Carboniferous version of our double duo, Mississippian and Pennsylvanian. So Pennsylvanian was the Carboniferous equivalent in America. And we would have the craziest set of oxygenated atmospheres. You see in the story here, I mean, it's an evolution of these simplistic animals all the way to these really incredibly diverse organisms. My point is this. When you're taking your test and your quizzes, the temptation is to get in a hurry and say, I don't know what this animal is. Be familiar with the names. 
be familiar with what Glossopteris is. Learn what and when the first primitive amphibian came about. Learn when the first known reptile in the upper Mississippian occurred. So if I were asked a question like, in what geologic period did the first reptile occur or appear, you would know it could not be in any shape, fashion, or form the early Paleozoic. Impossible. We didn't even have amphibians yet. So you have to use some common sense when you're taking your test to realize that there was a natural progression of evolution with organisms. So by the Permian period, we're fully diversified. Reptiles are highly complex. We have complex plants. We have forests. We have so much going on, and the Permian ends with this reset clock button for life. That will lead us into what we need to realize and study for the Permian highlights. Would you recognize Dimetrodon in the upper right corner there as your one of your index fossils for the Permian as a pelicosaur? I would hope so because it's not a dinosaur, but it's a very good marker of Permian-aged rocks. We learned about how Pangaea came together and what that meant for climate and the change of the interior of the continents being very desert-like conditions. I might kind of correlate that to the inland dunes of the Shinebly Hills, specifically Bell Rock Formation. El Capitan Reef Formation we learned about was something completely different that represented in West Texas and East New Mexico the marvel of the ocean that existed for Arbsaroka in limited places across the world during this time of Pangaea. We also learned that the pelicosaurs evolved and their carnivorous versions would evolve again and give rise to the therapsids, which are the mammal-like reptiles. And we would conclude our looking at life with Glossopteris, which is the most famous fossil of all of the Permian period. Understand its significance and what it represents to Gondwana land and the assemblance of the southern continents squashed up against the northern continents. But then we would end this remarkable seven period journey with the worst mass extinction event of all times. So when you're studying for your test and you're looking at these different periods, it's a lot of information. I get that. You just need to use some good old fashioned common sense about when would things evolve. If you spent time with their material and their well-organized thoughts, you'll be able to differentiate which particular periods would these things have first appeared in, and if they went extinct, when did they go extinct? If an orogeny first occurred, that would be worthy for you to know for test purposes. If a sloth sequence first advanced, that would be important for you to know. I'm giving you clues as to exactly what the test questions could be, because it is really straightforward in historical geology what should be on exams and quizzes for this very reason of the sequence of events that occurred. So I'm really looking forward to our next lessons together, which will be the beginning of the Mesozoic when we come to learn about the Triassic period. And that will begin the journey of the age of the dinosaurs, otherwise known as the age of the reptiles. And we will conclude the age of the invertebrates today. And I hope that you've enjoyed walking through the Paleozoic with me learning about one of the most remarkable times in geologic past when things evolved very quickly in comparison to how slow things were in the Precambrian. I'll see you in the Mesozoic. Bye.